So here we are, turn three of the US Civil War campaign game, which is the fall of 19, um, 19, <laughs> 1861. And um, I've just rolled for the um, first action phase of the turn, having done the reinforcements and strategic movement and leaders. Um, so uh, we got this, which is a Confederate six, a, sorry, I'm getting everything wrong here. A Union 6, a Confederate 5, so one action point in each theatre, exactly the result that the Union don't want um, because um, the Army of the Potomac is being led by the wildly incompetent um, McClellan here who takes two action points um, to activate. Um, he's been reinforced up to 13 um, strength points or about 65,000 men, a slightly gamey number but it's one that tips us into the may use three leaders and rolls 3d6 on the table. Um, and he's facing off against the Army of Northern Virginia which currently has 55,000 men still on the 11 column. Uh, but he can't activate so they're sitting um, either side of the um, Rappahannock here. Um, he can't activate, but the um, but the uh, Confederates could if they wanted to. So that's slightly annoying for him. Um, so the Union are in a position of having to find something useful to do with an action point over here. Um, McClellan could technically. No, he couldn't activate. So um, they could try bringing some. Uh, moving up another three guys out of Washington, just moving them into their army to reinforce him further. Uh, or Stoneman could c bring some uh, a point of cavalry down with him and give him the advantage of having some cavalry in his army, which is greater opportunity to intercept and evade. That might be useful as well. Um, and uh, yeah, in the West. Um, we now have an army here under, well, we've got the same army there under Halleck, but we've got a strong army here now with Buell in command with 12, 60,000 men in Buell and Pope um, in a big army there in Evansville. Um, the reason no one's going into Kentucky is because, well, the reason the Union aren't going into Kentucky is because... If the Union goes into Kentucky, then it instantly turns um, Confederate, and that would mean that all these all these objective hexes like Columbus and Bowling Green, and up here Lexington and Frankfurt and so on, uh, would all start providing um, Confederate build points until the Union went round and. Um, captured them all, which looks like an awful lot of effort. And um, in 1862, which is in two turns time, Kentucky will automatically become Union. So that's the way the rules work. It stays neutral until 62 and then it becomes uh, a Union state. Now, what that means is that there's some advantages to um, the Confederates running in and grabbing some of those things but the later they do it I think the better for them if they do it early they're just opening up um, Kentucky is another front in the war if you like and as you can see there's about there's two largish armies 90 odd thousand 100 thousand men sitting there and they haven't got anywhere near that they've got lots of leaders they've got loads of commanders in the west as you can see loads of generals um, no men to command with them. Um, so, uh, yeah, they're very wary of going into Bowling Green or or Colum um, Columbus or anywhere else because it looks like it's just, you know, poking the bear and suddenly that will allow Buell to just come stomping across the um, Ohio River and start laying waste to um, people. Um, and he is not... Um, he is not uh, cautious, so he only takes one action point to um, to uh, to activate. Um, 
so yeah over here they've done some uh, the union have done some tricky things they've railed um, some strength points down into Jefferson City that Curtis can now grab so that he can make an advance on Springfield so I think that's what they're going to do in the Trans Mississippi the other two areas the west and the um, east I'm really not too sure one thing you can do with action points is throw them into a training track you can see there's five Union points and four Confederate points on this training track um, and if you get up to the rule book says 10 I was told by someone uh, commenting on one video that it was five errata to five um, and now it looks like it's changed in the current living rules to seven but so I'm playing with seven but once you get once you've got seven action points on this track you can swap them for a, a strength point in the reinforcement phase. So it could be that the Union um, throw their east and their west points onto up to the seven. Or it could be that they actually do something with Stoneman and bring that cavalry down or reinforce um, um, McClellan some more in some way use the west point to get up to six and then do something um, with Curtis over in the Trans Mississippi. I think we're going to do that. So action phase one was pretty quiet. Let's do a quick dice roll to see um, what's happening on action phase two. We've got Confederate initiative but we've got three um, action points so that means that the Union when they get to act are going to get to do something. So um, Let's see how phase two goes, where we're guaranteed, I think, some action. OK, McClellan is finally moving. The Army of the Potomac is attempting to cross the Rappahannock um, here, um, from there to there, um, for a movement point. And um, now Johnson's got a decision to make, because he's dug in where he is. Um, does he let McClellan continue moving or does he try and shadow him? I mean, if he tries to shadow him, which he can do, well, he, uh, yeah, he, I think he can do. I think he could try and shadow him and move down here, um, possibly. Or it may be that as he moves here, he can try and shadow him and move here. But at some point, he's going to lose the um, advantages of his... Um, entrenchments. He's got to figure though that McClellan isn't going to attack him in those entrenchments, that McClellan is aiming for Richmond. Um, and so he might as well go for the interception across here and at least get the benefit of the, the Rappahannock which would be another plus one. Um, so he's going to go for the interception of Johnson. Um, he's got a plus two for his defence rating um, and he needs a nine so I don't think there are other, any other bonuses um, and he's got a six and he's failed to intercept McClellan crossing the river let's just see defence rating there's no cavalry involved there's no momentum um, nope there's no um, there's no other modifiers for him, so he's got a 6, plus 2, 8. And now McClellan's made it across the Rappahannock here. Uh, he, he is still entrenched though, I think, because he hasn't moved. So now McClellan has a decision. What's he actually doing? Um, I think he's aiming for uh, Richmond. So McClellan's going to move here. And at this point, I think that um, Johnson is allowed in the, uh, it's one of the optional rules, he's allowed to try and intercept and run parallel. He's, uh, he's allowed to try and um, essentially shadow the army of the Potomac without engaging it. Um, I'll try and find it in the rule book so that you can see it. If we come back over here, there's quite a nice diagram of it. It's under the optional rules somewhere. Here it is. It's called Maneuver Reaction. So um, 
similar to interception, but instead of entering the hex, the active force is about to enter, the reacting force enters uh, the hex adjacent, thereby keeping in contact. It can be visualised as a race to a location or attempt to follow at a distance. An enemy manoeuvre that will trigger an interception also triggers a manoeuvre attempt. A manoeuvre is a one hex move by a non-active force. Okay. Um, okay. So, I'm assuming that that's allowed even though the army of Potomac is essentially moving away. Uh, I mean, so this hex does moving into this hex does not trigger an interception attempt because they've moved away from the army of Northern Virginia. So I need to read this rule quite carefully to see whether what I'm proposing, which is a uh, an intercept into here to try and uh, maintain a block on Richmond is actually allowed. So actually having checked it I don't think the move that the Army of the Potomac just made triggers a um, any sort of intercept because they've not moved to uh, any sort of adjacent hex of the Army of Northern Virginia. So that failed intercept by, um, by uh, Johnson just now um, and he, I mean, he could have tried to sort of make one of these manoeuvre moves and gone there. He'd have a given up his uh, entrenchments, and b he'd have failed the roll anyway. So um, either way, he failed the roll. Um, and he, and having failed the roll when the army of the Potomac came in here, um, the uh, now the army of the Potomac gets to make the move it just made unhindered, and there's n there isn't a fourth round that can do anything about it. And so now the Army of the Potomac can come down here, and again there's no reaction from anything, and that is their moves. So now the, um, the Union have one more action phase, uh, action point to spend, and they are going to activate Patterson here, who is going to bring his force of two strength points into here for one, following the rail line, two, I think he can move through the mountains, let me just have a quick look, um, um, yeah, movement, uh, one, just says one, mm. Mountain hex side is plus one though. Okay. Um, and I don't think the rail helps. So I think that's one, two, three. But they're trying to get to here. Um, four. And Patterson's going to stop there. Now, there's another option of an intercept attempt here that that the Army of Northern Virginia could attempt to intercept at that point, but that's taking it further away from Richmond. So the idea of beating up on Patterson is quite nice, but if we do, we end up in, with the Army of Northern Virginia here, and that's not great for trying to defend Richmond. Um, on the other hand, if we lose the next initiative roll, we're um, not defending Richmond anyway. Bo Bo Re Beauregard's on his own with 5,000 men defending Richmond, um, which is not going to go well against an army of um, 60,000 or 70,000 that's uh, walking towards him. So um, what? this is another tough choice here. I'm really tempted to just batter Patterson and then um, take my chances. Let's say I win the next initiative and get at least one action point. Um, I can come one, two, three, four um, with or with McClellan, or with Johnson, sorry, and I could get back to here. Um, 
and then I'm going to be able to intercept into Richmond when it's attacked. And if I don't make that, well, that's hard cheese. OK, let's have a go at battering Patterson then, um, since he's been cheeky enough um, to move into an area where I, can, I get a reaction against him. The other reason for doing this is that I'm going to try and cut the Army of the Potomac out of supply. And because it won't have any sort of line of communication, which Patterson is currently sort of keeping open, I think. Hmm. Questions, questions. I'm going to have a look at the supply situation as we stand here. So I just checked this and um, the Army of the Potomac as it stands, irrespective of whether the Army of Northern Virginia attacks Patterson or not, the Army of the Potomac is going to end this action cycle out of supply and foraging. And the reason for that is because a line of communication which keeps you in limited supply, full supply is being adjacent to, you know, a, a supply source like, you know, being in Alexandria right next to Washington or something. Most things operate on limited supply, and that means being four movement points away from a, what a depot. And Patterson moved down here. I moved Patterson down here to act as a depot, um, which seemed like a good thing to do. Unfortunately for the Army of the Potomac, the line of communication can't move through a, a sort of zone of influence. What what they well, zone of control in most war games, but zone of influence. So the Army of Northern Virginia has got too much influence on this hex for, for Union supply to pass through it. So they can't, can't trace one, two, three here. And they can't trace one, two, three, four, because it, it can occur, five, because it can only be four long. And they can't trace across this mountain because that's two movement points and it's, it's costed in movement points. So that's one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And so they don't have an open line of communication. So the Army of the Potomac is going to end in out of supply. And that means the Army of Virginia is wasting its time and strength trying to engage Patterson, which is taking it further away from where it needs to be. And so um, we are not going to intercept, but it's, there's going to be a very, very important initiative die roll right now. So let me just pop pop a um, an attrition marker if I can find one uh, an out of supply marker. There we go. A foraging out of supply marker. There you go. So what that means is that if that would come into focus, that is one my movement point. And if they're defending in a combat, they get a step reduction. So they move one step down on the chart. So the Army of the Potomac is foraging. Um, huh. And that's really interesting. Because when you put it on there, that minus one movement point means they've now got two movement points. And if you look at how they could attack Richmond, crossing here, in other words, trying to cross the James River, would cost them two movement points and wouldn't leave them the movement points to attack into Richmond. So the only viable route, tactical route for them to attack into Richmond now is via Hanover and then across this, down this road, because that doesn't cross a, doesn't cross a river. So that now means that occupying Hanover would be really, really good. <laughs> Um, for the Army of Northern Virginia because it would essentially stop the attack on Richmond. But it does mean winning an initiative dice roll. Um, so let's see what happens. Uh, blah, 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 blah. And it's a one point win for the Union and one point is not sufficient for them to activate McClelland. Would you believe it? Uh, <laughs> Amazing. So, um, crazy. This game is crazy. Um, okay. So, so, all right, we've got the uh, one point differential uh, and we've got uh, uh, Union Initiative. So do they have a card? Do they have an East or an any card that they can play um, to activate McClellan and attack Richmond? And the answer is no, they've got a West, a Naval and a Trans-Mississippi. 
um, no good to them at all. Uh, so, um, wow. Uh, they're going to have to have a think about what they do then. Uh, because it, if they can't get um, McClellan back in supply now, um, then there could be further problems for him um, in terms of taking attrition in the um, sort of uh, the supply or the, the, the reinforcement phases or whatever. Um, so yeah, let's, um, let's have a look and see what happens next. Well, I'll tell you what happens next, which is that um, uh, during the supply phase of the previous uh, action cycle, um, the um, the union have to make a supply uh, have to make an attrition roll. Um, so it says that if you um, end. Um, a ter uh, an action phase um, uh, if a friendly stack with a foraging marker uh, all friendly stacks with a foraging marker suffer attrition during the supply segment and the supply segment doesn't often come into play because I haven't been moving things out of supply but if we come over here into an action phase you get movement and combat but then you get a supply segment. The phasing player checks the supply state of his unit. Units that are out of supply receive a foraging marker and suffer supply attrition. That means that having just had that supply uh, foraging marker put on it, um, McClellan's army has to now um, make an attrition roll. And that's on this table here. And the modifiers are, if he's demoralised plus two, well he's not, his um, minus his attack rating, well his attack rating is zero. Um, he's not, it, it's not winter, but it is fall, so that's plus one. And he's not in woods, mountains or marsh, he's in open terrain. So there's a plus one on the die roll. And um, he has got with him 16 strength points. So he's in the 13 to 16 column here trying to... Um, trying to forage and um, uh, we are going to roll a dice here and he's got a two plus one for the fall turn is three and that means that two of his strength points are displaced and go into um, a displacement box um, from which they return at some point in a reinforcement or end phase or something. Um, but he's just lost two strength points for the moment. Okay, well, through a combination of sort of incompetence and aggression here, we've um, I've developed what is an absolutely fascinating situation. Fascinating for me, anyway. I, I, I'm the only one playing, but... Uh, <laughs> It is really good. Um, so to try and explain some of my thinking here, um, I can't find a comfortable position to stand or kind of crouch with the camera, but here we go. So we've got one um, action point in this theatre. The Army of the Potomac here has got McClellan, who requires two to activate, but it also has Burnside in it, who's a two-star general in his own right. So he can command six strength points. If he activates, he, he has to take a foraging marker as well. So he'd have three movement points. But that would still be enough for him to move into here and attack Beauregard, who's defending Richmond with a mere 5,000 men in some fortifications, in some entrenchments. So he could uh, have a go at seizing Richmond, which sounds like it would be a really good thing for the Union, and it would be a really good thing. I mean, there's six build points coming out of Richmond, and it would be a significant loss, a massive loss 
for the Confederacy. Why not do it then, you ask? Well, a couple of reasons. Firstly, we'd still all be out of supply and so dwindling away, um, we'd then take more of these supply rolls um, and so we'd lose more men, more manpower to um, to the foraging rolls and this army would essentially be sort of slowly being whittled away by natural wastage and being in hostile territory and not in supply. So we'd lose some more guys from that. Another reason is that this, the Army of Northern Virginia is still here. Um, and it might then decide to stomp up here and do the same to Washington which although it is defended by three strength points in a fort that still probably doesn't look like good odds against the 55,000 men that would be coming towards it and an intercept by Patterson is likely to get brushed aside so um, it's sort of mutually assured destruction, destruction if we go this route we might have a go at taking Richmond with our 30,000 against their 5,000 but then we're giving them a shot at Washington with their guys does that look clever? Um, not really. Um, the next turn is a, w a winter turn where you don't get strength point reinforcements either, so we're not even going to get to reinforce Washington when we roll out round into the next reinforcements phase, although we could rail in those troops from Harrisburg. We could use strategic movement to reinforce it from various points, probably over in the West Theatre. We could take some of Fremont or Halleck's troops because they're useless and rail them into Washington and reinforce it that way. So we could definitely reinforce it. Um, but, yeah, this is looking um, unpleasant. So the other reason not um, to worry about it is because, let's say... Um, let's say we attack. We, we're attacking with six troops. Um, Burnside's got a 1 attack rating and we're not going to have any other bonuses so we're going to be rolling a d6 plus 1 mm, we've got a fair chance of causing 1 casualty we might get a 1 star if we roll a 6 we get 2 and we, definite, a two and we definitely win um, they're rolling plus 3 so the odds are, are in our favour but still if they get um, if we get a low roll and they get a high roll we won't even win the battle um, they will get wiped out but we won't win the battle um, and interestingly if the um, you can win a battle you can be eliminated and still win a battle in other words um, they uh, if, if we got a 1 with a, <clears throat> a 1, 2 or 3 50% 50, 50 chance and then they got a 1 by rolling a 4, 5 or 6 uh, in fact a 3, 4, 5 or 6 then the battle would be a, a defensive win um, and then we don't even take Richmond we take the loss, we don't take Richmond we're still all stuck out of supply and then they get a choice of whether to go and um, smash into Washington. Um, yeah, so that's the choice we're making at the moment. Um, uh, as the union, I think we've got to go for it. Let, let's 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 just go for it. Um, we've 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 sort of rolled the dice. We've burnt past the um, defences of the Army of Northern Virginia. So now what we have to do is um, go for it and see what happens. So I will just split these forces out and then we will uh, continue from there. Okay, so here we go. We've got um, Burnside with six troops attacking Richmond 
defended by Beauregard with one, and it's a five five. So what that means is that um, Burnside gets a six, which is a one star result. So he he inflicts one casualty, and um, Beauregard inflicts one casualty, but Burnside wins, and the Union have just taken Richmond. So although the Union have lost um, five strength points, 25,000 men to foraging and battle, um, they are now in control of Richmond, and that gives the Army of Northern Virginia all kinds of problems, which is that they're currently out of supply. Um, so, um, yeah, that may cause them... Uh, that may cause them problems. Um, and now what do they do? Do they come back and they try and recapture Richmond? Or do they um, run forward and try and attack Washington? Um, if they attack Washington... Um, Although that looks kind of tempting in the long run, it doesn't it doesn't look great because what we know then happens is that all kinds of um, Union troops from the west get railed into Baltimore and Philadelphia and and um, so on, and we probably get driven back even if we manage to take it. And meanwhile, um, two armies down here probably carry on ploughing through, ransacking Petersburg and Lynchburg and, and trying to run down here and, and, and um, grab uh, other bits of our economy. Although this, this six build point loss at Richmond is really grim. Um, but there we go. Uh, so we could just run forward and maybe take this opportunity to grab Washington, because if we don't take it now, we probably don't get it again. The, the question is, are we better off trying to take Washington, or are we better off main preserving our army, which will slowly get battered, um, and coming back and trying to um, beat up these two armies, which are now split up and could probably be defeated in detail. Um, the, I really don't know the answer to that question. Um, it's very, very unpleasant choice to have to make um, for the Confederates because there really is nothing, you know, they've got, they've, apart from the Army of Northern Virginia, there's nothing defending Virginia or North Carolina or, or or, or anything. Um, so um, if they don't fall back and defend it, you know, we're not getting reinforcements this term, which means that in the winter they could lose lots more stuff. And by the time they get reinforcements, and their reinforcements aren't well concentrated anyway, it could all be over. Um, you know, they could just have lost a lot of a lot of Virginia and North Carolina as well and be defending somewhere around Columbia. Um, wow, that doesn't look like a great option. Um, on the other hand, um, running forward and taking Washington and at least inflicting a sort of moral defeat has has its has its kind of um, well it, it, it has its draw or its appeal in the fact that you know the Confederates always want to try and take Washington um, I suppose at this point we're talking about what victory conditions are um, on the turn track there's a little number here which is a victory point um, tracker and this is your sort of par score as the Union. If you've got this many victory points you're on track and if you've got um, fewer then you're you're behind schedule and if you've got more you're ahead. And if I, I think if you get tw if you're at any point you're 12 fewer then you lose automatically and if at any point you're 12 more you win automatically. I think that's roughly the um, situation. The, the um, Union are currently on 11 victory points so they're five ahead of schedule at the moment.
Um, and it goes up to 9 next turn, so around 20 or 21, and they'd be that they'd be winning an automatic victory. Um, if the Confederates grab Washington, they'll get three victory points for that, which subtracted from the Union's 11 would leave them with eight, and they'd still be well ahead of schedule. And it's only a sort of how I managed to capture Washington with the Confederates that that makes it even remotely, um, remotely sort of appealing as an option. I don't think it's very sensible though, so I'm going to have a bit of a read of the victory conditions and see what to do next. Well, the attack on Washington, um, after some thought, seemed like a pretty doomed idea. I didn't like it. It looked like short-termism in the extreme. Um, the victory points would have been okay, but they would have been lost again fairly swiftly and we'd have lost our army and it would have just opened up far too much territory ready to be um, conquered. Whereas main preserving our army, recapturing Richmond and trying to rebuild some stability um, looked like, it doesn't look great, but it looked like a better option. Yes, that's a bit of a blow to our economy, but it's not the end of the world. We're back in control of Richmond and um, we go from here. We've also split the Army of the Potomac into two forces, both of which are out of supply. And when we took Richmond, interestingly, um, uh, Burnside managed to make a successful avoid battle attempt, but, um, but then didn't have many options of where to go to. We attacked out of Hanover here into Richmond. He couldn't go here because it was in the zone of influence from where we were attacking from. He couldn't go into Petersburg because it's a build point, a resource build point hex um, under Confederate control. He's just not allowed to use that as a retreat path. So he had the choice of coming over here, which is even further away from being in supply, or out here into these kind of scraggy um, peninsulas um, towards the Hamptons. Uh, or Hampton, sorry, not the Hamptons, but towards Hampton here. Um, that didn't look great either, but neither of these options here looked terribly isolated and um, and uh, here looked a little bit better, like he might eventually be able to move out this way and get back into some sort of supply situation, possibly. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's the situation at the end of turn three, which has been... Um, pretty crazy. So um, I think I've now done all three, um, all three uh, phases for for that turn, and we're going into um, winter sixty one, where we don't get any reinforcements. So um, yeah, um, more things to think about here. Um, the Confederates would love some reinforcements because they'd love to stick some troops in Fredericksburg that would help cut these buyers out of supply, but I think they're going to be, um, the uh, McClellan at least is going to be back in supply because of Patterson and he's no longer holding Fredericksburg and we're going to struggle to hold Fredericksburg, we're going to struggle to hold Lynchburg, we're going to struggle to hold Petersburg, we're going to struggle to hold everything to be honest. Um, this is looking really very unpleasant at the moment for, for the Confederates in, uh, in the East. Um, so, um, uh, God knows what happens when the Union get motoring in the West, but um, yeah, this is um, not going their way at the moment.